I'm your host, Neil Howard, here on Health Professional Radio. Glad that you could join us for one more time. We're going to have a conversation this morning with returning guest, Dr. Bruce Sands. Now, Dr. Sands is lead invest, lead study investigator at ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, New York, and he's returning to talk with us about Janssen's announcement of their new two-year data from the long-term extension of the Phase Three Unify study of Stellara. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Sands. How are you? Good, thanks. Thanks very much. For our listeners who uh, may not be familiar with you, when you were with us before, I did say, of course, that you're lead study investigator there at the ICANN School of Medicine. A brief background for our listeners, if you would. Sure. Uh, I'm a gastroenterologist who's been involved in uh, clinical trials in inflammatory bowel disease for more than 25 years. And I've been here at Mount Sinai for 10 years. Now, what is Stellara and what is it um, approved for? Stellara is an anti-P40 antibody. P40 is a component of both interleukin-12 and interleukin-23, and so it blocks both of those important uh, cytokines which are involved in adaptive immune responses. Um, The drug is already approved for psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, and most importantly for us for Crohn's disease, and recently was approved as well for the indication of ulcerative colitis that's moderately to severely active. Now, how do Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis uh, differ? Well, Crohn's disease is a disease that uh, predominantly affects the distal small bowel and or the large bowel. It really can affect any part of the GI tract, whereas ulcerative colitis is a disease that's confined by definition to the large bowel and also is a more superficial inflammation involving only the mucosa. The symptoms also vary a bit in that Typically, in ulcerative colitis, we would see increase in stool frequency, or namely diarrhea, and rectal bleeding, whereas in Crohn's disease, we may typically may see abdominal pain rather than rectal bleeding, as well as diarrhea. Now, you're an expert in, in the management of IBD. Stellara is in a phase three uh, study now for the treatment of uh, UC. Well, phase three was completed, and that, that's what led to the approval of Stellara for ulcerative colitis. Um, what's going on now is the patients who are enrolled in the phase three program are being followed up in a long-term extension study, and that's what I reported on at UEGW this year. And what were the, um, the major takeaways of your uh, reporting? So we looked at patients uh, in, in treatment for as long as two years out, two years of maintenance therapy, and found that the drug has good durability of effect. Essentially, in the most conservative analysis for patients who who had responded to the induction dosing, uh, at the end of two years, you have uh, conservatively two-thirds of patients who are in symptomatic remission uh, out through week 92. In less conservative analyses, which allow for escalation of dose from the every 12-week dosing to every eight-week dosing, that rate goes up to symptomatic remission as high as 83%. So in other words, you could say that when the drug is good, it's very, very good and has excellent durability. Can we get a cross-section of the subjects uh, who are being studied now? Sure. So these are patients who, by definition, came into treatment protocol with moderate to severely symptomatic disease. This included not only symptoms of diarrhea and rectal bleeding, but also endoscopically active disease um, at baseline. Additionally, all of them had failed one or more therapies uh, that are used already for ulcerative colitis. These might have included aminosalicylates or immunomodulators, and more than half of patients had uh, prior or concomitant treatment with, with corticosteroids. Additionally, um, roughly half of the patients had biologic failure, meaning they had previously been treated with anti-TNF therapy and failed, or some had also been treated with vetalizumab, which is an anti-alpha-4 beta-7 integrin antibody, so a different class of biologic, and uh, maybe 11 or 12 percent had failed both anti-TNF and vetalizumab. Uh, And in all of these treatment groups, the drug proved to be effective. Now, when we're talking about these symptoms and this condition, are we talking a pathway to a cure, prevention, or is this something that is simply uh, or going to be managed for the rest of a patient's life? 
Yes, at, at this point, unfortunately, no one has suggested any treatment that would be considered to be a cure. In ulcerative colitis, I think some colorectal surgeons would like to believe that uh, total proctocolectomy and formation of a J pouch surgically is a cure. And nominally it is, but uh, the, the patients who have a J pouch, while they're very happy with the outcome of their J pouch, they typically have five to seven bowel movements a day, often with one overnight. There are issues with half of patients having at least one episode of pouch inflammation called pouchitis. So it is not quite like life with a healthy colon. So at this point, all of the treatments that we have really address the immune system and inflammation that is uh, the foundation of ulcerative colitis and therefore all the symptoms and suppress the inflammation. So all of these treatments are intended to be maintenance therapies to control the disease, much in the same way that we would approach a patient with hypertension and continue treatment lifelong uh, because the disease, the condition just doesn't go away. When you say that um, a subject or a percentage of subjects failed, what exactly are you talking about? Are you talking about severe remission uh, into the condition? Are you talking about uh, enhanced symptoms as a result of the failure? What exactly does that mean? Um, does it mean that they're no longer a candidate for traditional treatment? Well, in, in this study, when a patient failed, they were, by, by the investigator's definition uh, or opinion, uh, the patient was no longer responding to the treatment. That was left up to the individual clinician treating the patient. So there was not a standard definition. It means that um, they did not see a point in continuing treatment with the eustachinumab because the response was no longer adequate. And no doubt some of those patients went on potentially to other treatments, maybe other clinical trials. Some of them perhaps went on to, to surgery. Let's talk about ulcerative uh, colitis. Uh, is there any way that um, is lifestyle or anything like that an, indi uh, an indicator or a cause of uh, ulcerative colitis? You know, the, the cause of ulcerative colitis is still not completely well understood. Uh, we clearly do understand that there is some genetic contribution and, in fact, more than 200 uh, inflammatory bowel disease susceptibility genes have been identified, but each of them individually has a very small contribution to the risk of having either Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And interestingly, uh, those conditions overlap quite a bit in their genetics. Um, but more prominently, we think that there are environmental factors that make one susceptible to developing ulcerative colitis, but those are poorly understood. A lot of attention focuses on the microbiome and potentially on uh, the effects of diet uh, altering the microbial composition of the bowel. Uh, but how to manipulate that and what the most uh, optimal diet is, is not well understood. How to manipulate the microbiome through other means, through fecal microbial therapy or what's called stool transplant, um, is still in its infancy. So at the moment, we, we can't really offer much advice about lifestyle recommendations. We do know that some people will flare if they're taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, we do know that uh, patients um, who quit smoking uh, may, be, uh, may be more prone to developing ulcerative colitis. Um, and meaning that smoking is somewhat protective, although we wouldn't recommend that people take up smoking to, to treat their disease. Absolutely. Obviously. Absolutely. As always, a pleasure talking with you, quite informative, and um, I'm sure we'll be speaking again as things progress there at Janssen and uh, with you there at uh, ICANN. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Transcripts and audio of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Listen in, download it, SoundCloud, and be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Health Professional Radio.